Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me here and um, online. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I am more than willing uh, to come back at a later date to give a talk on bats or any mammal. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm a mammal curator at the Ram, so um, uh, most of the times I get roped into doing anything that is involved with uh, furry creatures such as mammals. Uh, so originally it was bats, um, but then it became rodents, or uh, well, it became rodents, but now also whales. Uh, yeah, so basically I'll be talking about um, the two exhibitions um, that have occurred uh, at the ROM. Uh, and the original one uh, was on blue whales. Uh, so uh, for those that have missed uh, that missed the blue whale exhibition, it is now touring in Edmonton, um, I think in, probably until the springtime. Uh, and hopefully um, uh, it'll be going down to a, a few places in the US as well, uh, and maybe other parts of the world. Um, so uh, as, uh, if we can keep it on tour as long as possible, that's, that's better because um, we're not really sure exactly where we're going to put it uh, when it comes back to the ROM, just because it's so big. Uh, so that, that, that's one of the reasons why I like uh, small things like bats and rodents is that they fit easily on a, on a drawer and a cabinet. Uh, the blue whale is a little bit bigger than that. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to start um, by uh, showing you, uh, th this is actually the introductory video um, to uh, the Great Whales exhibition, the second one, uh, but th this will give you um, a good introduction and uh, a bit of a flavor of what I'll be uh, talking to you about. Uh, so if I want to run this, uh, I'm press that one. Uh, this is about maybe two or three minutes long. Uh, hopefully the audio, wor oh, okay, the audio is not working on it. Um, it's, but we've got the caption. Okay, I'll let you read the caption then. that is so mysterious. We don't have a sense of their home as much as we have a sense of our home. They seem to be uh, more human than we are. They are uh, very placid creatures. Mi'kmaq, you know, think of them as the ones that keep the stories of the world because they live so long and, and they're always there uh, watching everything. Regardless of what we have done to them in, in history, they are still drawn to us. The closer we can get to whales, uh, the better we can understand them. One of the things uh, people probably don't realize about whales is that their closest living relatives are hippos. They have these unique adaptations uh, that have allowed them to evolve from land mammals to sea mammals. These are mammoth animals, and so to see their heart that's the size of a small car, to see their body and how it's put together. It's similar to ours, but it's very different. It is also very fascinating. They have babies like we have babies, and for some of them, they live their lives in tight-knit social circles. Whales play an integral part in the ecosystem of the marine environment on the Atlantic coast and are foundational to the working of the entire ecosystem in the ocean. There's a lot we're doing to the ocean which is a big threat to the whales. The two major ones that we see and our colleagues throughout the world see are animals that are hit by vessels and those that are caught up in fishing gear purely accidentally. This is a particular problem for the North Atlantic right whale but it affects a lot of other whales too. The whales are increasingly debilitated, they're in extraordinary pain, it's a horrible, horrible death and uh, it not only reduces their populations but it, it, it's just awful for them as individuals. 
If whales end up going extinct, that will have a cascading effect on the health of uh, ocean ecosystems in general. For the most part, the things that hurt these animals are things we do to them. And so therefore, it's our problem to solve, not the whales. We share the environment with the whales and what affects us affects them. We need to really come to respect and appreciate the great teachings that the whales have to offer. Okay, so hopefully uh, you get a better flavor of um, what the uh, exhibitions were about. Uh, but uh, as Jim mentioned in the beginning, um, uh, I was just one of uh, a bigger team there. So there's a lot of people that helped us out uh, on these exhibitions, uh, not only at the ROM, uh, but also researchers um, and people from uh, throughout Canada and from throughout the world that helped us uh, on this exhibition on whales. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll more or less try to walk you through uh, certain parts of the exhibition as I go through my presentation. Um, so basically, I, I put together um, the two exhibitions, the first one on blue whales with the second one on great whales. Um, yeah, so this was the, so the, the video that you guys just saw, that was our introduction. Uh, so you can sort of see that uh, on the left of, of the screen. Uh, and then um, after that, uh, the visitor walked uh, through sort of introductory hallway. Uh, so then we explained exactly, you know, how we ended up, you know, with whales and why we are talking about whales. Uh, yeah, so as you see, uh, going back to 2014, um, for those of you, for those of you, you have, that saw the exhibition um, in 2017, uh, it was based on uh, blue whales that were found in 2014. Uh, so that was a very unusual year in that nine blue whales were found dead in the ice pack of the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, in March. Uh, so, um, so I marked off in that red circle uh, on the map there. Uh, so that that was very unusual. Um, like maybe uh, they 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 might find like one or two dead whales. You know maybe you know every year or every other year, um, but they had you know they had never seen nine blue whales. So that was sort of an unprecedented event. Um, so uh, we uh, at the ROM were just in the process of thinking about putting on a permanent gallery of whales. So we had accumulated some other whales, a sperm whale, which you'll see in a second. Um, and we had a humpback whale, a fin whale, but we didn't have the blue whale, which is the biggest species of all. So when we heard about this uh, in the news, like a lot of people did, uh, we asked the Department of Fisheries and Ocean if any one of those nine whales happened to wash ashore, let us know. We weren't expecting them to because most of the times blue whales actually sink. Uh, they don't wash ashore. Um, but um, in, uh, within a month after they were found, uh, two of them actually did wash ashore. And uh, I sort of I think it was uh, uh, sort of winning or losing the lottery is that they wash ashore uh, right in the middle of, of two small communities. Uh, so on the west coast of Newfoundland, um, is, is not that well inhabited. Uh, and for two of the whales to appear on the doorstep of these two small communities, um, yeah, so, so that was, you know, the odds of that happening uh, weren't great, uh, but it did. And of course, you know, what were they going to do about it? Because um, uh, the smallest one, Trout River, is only um, a community of 500 people. Um, uh, so just luckily that uh, the ROM was looking for uh, uh, not two blue whales, but one blue whale, but we ended up helping out with both uh, blue whales. Um, so that was um, uh, sort of April. It took us a little while to, uh, uh, to sort of uh, uh, get all set up to actually get out there. So it wasn't until the beginning of uh, May that we got out there. Uh, and, this, and this is just a short uh, video clip of uh, how we found the whale when we got uh, out there. And um, the day before uh, we, so this is early May, it, it snowed uh, the day before we got there. So you can see on, uh, on the back uh, and the hills on the back. Um, so we, we, we uh, learned, we figured pretty quickly that there was no way we we're going to be able to work on this, you know, 100 ton carcass when it was still in the water. 
Um, but then not only that, but it's in front of uh, this rocky coastline, uh, in front of this boardwalk. So even if we were able to skin it down to the bones, we'd have to lift everything, you know, off, you know, over the rocks, over the boardwalk. Uh, so we knew that, and we had to do something else um, to uh, to salvage this the, the bones from this particular specimen. Uh, so what we ended up doing was um, we ended up uh, hiring a uh, boat to tow the blue whale uh, from Trout River uh, to a place called Woody Point. Uh, so uh, driving by road, it would be about a half hour uh, drive by road, um, but by, uh, by sea, uh, it took uh, two hours uh, for the boat uh, to tow the blue whale to Woody Point. Uh, so Woody Point is... Um, uh, it's located in an inlet, um, so it was more protected, uh, but they also had an old fishing plant, or not an old, the fishing plant wasn't being used uh, at that particular time of year, uh, so we were able to, um, to use their facilities there. Uh, and, the, and this is just the video uh, of hauling up the blue whale. Yeah, so ba basically this, this thing was like, uh, I think it was about 26 meters long. Uh, so uh, obviously a big animal. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, so we had two um, uh, dump trucks that uh, were pulling it uh, onto the boat ramp. Uh, so we ended up um, uh, skinning the carcass uh, on this boat ramp uh, at, at this uh, fishing plant. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, show you all the gory details, uh, but again, Jim had mentioned uh, that the, the YouTube videos apparently are still uh, up there on our website. Uh, so I, I just given you a very uh, slight selection of uh, videos here. Um, yeah, so the upper left, um, it, it's amazing that like 100 years later, um, you know, we're still using the same techniques that the, the whalers used 100 years ago. Uh, so basically, um, the person up on top, uh, so he's got what's called a flensing knife. Uh, so it's, basically, it's a really long blade uh, with a handle. Uh, and basically, you, you cut up, you, you, um, you cut uh, workable sections um, that you're able to uh, use uh, uh, hooks to peel off the skin and the blubber to get to the flesh. And then you got to basically hack away at the flesh to get down to the bones. Um, and then the lower left is, uh, yeah, so we work from the tail end uh, towards the head. Uh, so the bottom left uh, is we've hit the, uh, the rib cage. So we've cleaned off all those bones uh, and we're just about to tackle the head. Uh, the upper right, um, another good thing about um, uh, doing this at the fish processing plant is that we had access to heavy equipment. So we had a front end loader. Uh, we had a couple of dump trucks uh, because uh, like all of the being that was in the community, we just couldn't, you know, throw, you know, all of the, the flesh, which would be, you know, tons <laughs> back into the water because obviously there would be a health issue uh, within the community. Uh, so we had to uh, take it to a, a landfill site, but we, the landfill site had to be, uh, had to be authorized by the, um, by the township. Um, but it, uh, it wasn't just a normal landfill because it had, you know, organic, potentially toxic waste. So it had to be lined um, uh, with limestone to neutralize um, sort of the fat that's leaching out. Um, yeah, so, so obviously uh, with um, the access to uh, heavy equipment like dump trucks, uh, that, you know, made our life a lot easier. Uh, and then the bottom photo uh, on the right uh, is uh, the crew of 10 people. Uh, so we basically we work we work six days from seven a.m. to seven p.m. Uh, to skin this hundred ton blue whale down to the bones. Uh, I, I think this is the only graph that I'll show you guys. Um, so as mentioned, uh, most of my work is on bats. Uh, so th so this is my um, how, how much effort goes into skinning a mammal. Uh, so a bat I can do you know in a few minutes. Uh, I've done a muskox up in the Arctic. Uh, so it was two of us working uh, two days to, to skin that down to the bone. Uh, I've worked on an elephant that, uh, that died at the Toronto Zoo. Uh, so that was, uh, I think that was six of us working two days to get that to the bones. Uh, the blue whale was um, 
uh, 10 of us working uh, six days. Uh, so as you can see, that is an exponential curve. So the bigger the animal, the more work is a take home message there. Uh, this is another short video clip of, um, so this is the jaw, the mandible. Yeah, so, so we, we really don't know, but we're guessing that that jaw uh, weighed about a ton. Uh, so obviously, uh, I suppose 10 of us maybe might have budged it a little bit, but uh, having the front end loader made it a lot easier for us. Yeah, so if we didn't have the heavy equipment, uh, I think it would have taken uh, you know more than six days for us to, to work on this thing. Uh, and this is a picture of the, the two jaws before they ended up getting loaded up onto a tractor trailer. So, um, so there's two specimens, I, I didn't mention it, but there's another, uh, the other blue whale washed ashore at uh, Rocky Harbor. Uh, so that's the big town in the area that has a population of 1,000 people. Uh, but they, they um, their blue whale um, uh, got uh, sort of stuck on the shallow bay area. So it didn't actually wash right ashore, uh, unlike the one at Trout River that had to be dealt with, you know, almost immediately because it, it, it also bloated up as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, so by the time we did prepared both of the, uh, blue whale, uh, specimens down to skeletons, it took two of these, uh, tractor trailers, and, and, the, and these are the, the reefers, the refrigerated tractor trailers. Uh, so basically, um, the skull and the jaws of both whales went into one, and then the other bones, um, the ribs, vertebrae, they went in the other one, uh, then their truck back to Ontario, uh, to a company called Research Castings International, which I'll, I'll uh, talk a little bit more about in a second. And um, it, it, it made the news. Um, so uh, all the major newspapers, not only in Canada, but um, uh, throughout the world, uh, the BBC picked it up. Uh, it was on Al, uh, Al Jazeera News Network. Um, we actually even had a, a reporter from the Toronto Star that was with us the whole week we were there. So she was writing like a daily uh, column uh, uh, on, you know, the ROM, you know, uh, salvaging this carcass of the blue whale. Um, but my favorite is uh, on the episode of Saturday Night Live. So we were there for two weeks. It was the middle Saturday that we were there. And, and we didn't know this because uh, we didn't have TV. Uh, and we're so tired from working, you know, uh, you know, 12 hours a day. Uh, so th this wasn't until after the fact that uh, people told us, by the way, there, there are these two blue whales that were featured on a skit on Saturday Night Live. Um, yeah, well, the, well, that was the dead giveaway. It, uh, so they were talking about, you know, bloated blue whale or whales exploding carcasses. But it wasn't one blue whale. It was two blue whales. So that was a dead giveaway that they were talking about our blue whales. So, so we, we had our 15 seconds of fame uh, on Saturday Night Live. Uh, but back to reality. So these, uh, the skeletons uh, got trucked back to uh, Trenton, Ontario, where Research Castings International is located. So they're a company that, um, so they do, prior, they start off primarily um, assembling dinosaur skeletons for museums. Uh, and in fact, the person that started the company back in the 80s, he worked at the Haram and decided to strike on his own uh, to form his own company. So now uh, RCI is the go-to company uh, in the world uh, for uh, not just dinosaurs, but any large uh, type of museum uh, display that needs to be done. So they do a lot of whales. Uh, the Smithsonian redid um, their Hall of Whales. Oh, no, no, sorry, their dinosaurs. Um, they, they redid their dinosaurs a few years back. RCI did that. Uh, I was in uh, Shanghai uh, before the pandemic, uh, so they had a new uh, natural history museum, uh, and RCI did all of the dinosaurs for that. Uh, the natural history museum in London, uh, they have a blue whale skeleton hanging uh, in their foyer area, uh, so R RCI did that. Yeah, so so the the company, uh, so. Um, so when these two trucks arrived uh, with the whale uh, skeletons. Um, but, but be, even before that, um, yeah, so they're, you know, basically in, in farming country out, out, out around Trenton. 
Uh, so they put the word out to their neighbors, um, you know, we need fresh manure and we need a lot of fresh manure because we we're going to compost, you know, the, the bones uh, to, you know, clean them off. Um, and uh, on the photo on the, uh, the left, uh, you can sort of see uh, the steam rising. Uh, so th this was fresh manure. Uh, so I, I think it was like eight dump trucks, you know, it was all coordinated. The trucks arrived with this, the skeletons and then the dump trucks with the manure steaming fresh. Uh, so then they modified the shipping containers. Um, they put the, the bones in, you know, filled it up with uh, manure. Uh, but you can see that the, the shipping containers are modified, so there's been um, openings uh, on the top. Uh, and you can just uh, sort of see a, a piece of tubing, like um, um, uh, uh, like tubing in there, uh, because um, the compost uh, works very well, and the heat builds up very, very quickly. Uh, and uh, if you're not careful, um, not only will the flesh disappear, but also the bones will start... <laughs> You know, disappearing with enzymatic breakdown of the bacteria and everything else, everything else, and the heat buildup is really high. Uh, so you really, uh, uh, and this went through a winter too. Uh, so you need to cool this thing off because you don't want to find out that your blue, your hundred ton blue whale disappeared uh, in the manure compost. Uh, but it, it was in there for uh, over a year, about a year and a half uh, before they were hauled out. Uh, but actually, the, the real difficult part was getting all the oil, all the grease out of the bones. Um, so uh, RCI, uh, they're very uh, inventive. So they made, basically, it was a car wash for whale bones. Uh, so they, so they, they, they have this big factory uh, out in Trenton, a warehouse. Uh, so they got the biggest portable outdoor swimming pool. They put it up inside their warehouse. Uh, and basically they, they put this, the bones in there, uh, and then they had these high pressure, um, nozzle sprays. Um, uh, so basically they, they were going through like a stationary car wash, uh, yeah, to get all of the, uh, the fat. So basically it was like 25 hours of spraying with a detergent. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, basically it's like washing your dishes, right? If you just use, rinse them off with the water all the grease will be stuck on the plate because, um, you know, the water and the grease, they don't mix. But if you put detergent in there, the detergent latches on to the fat. And now when you rinse it, then it comes off the water. Uh, so basically that, that's what we're, we're doing here. Uh, but obviously with big things with, you know, the grease, you know, inside, you know, all these big bones. Uh, so that took uh, about uh, six months to get all of, you know, those bones uh, degreased before they can start uh, actually putting it together uh, you know, re-articulating the bones uh, so that it would look, you know, uh, lifelike. Um, and the final uh, finished product. So this was in 2017. Uh, yeah, so this exhibition was actually part of the ROMs. This is the ROMs major display for uh, Canada's uh, sesquicentennial, uh, 150th anniversary. I, th I think it's sesquicentennial. Um, and, and the thing was that originally uh, we were hoping to have a permanent gallery uh, on whales, not just a blue whale exhibition. Um, but of course, when 2017 was rolling up, we, uh, the ROM said, well, what are we going to do you know, for the special celebration of Canada's birthday? Uh, so people say, oh, we, we should do the blue whale. And we're saying, no, no, we do, you know, because now it's only like a year out. And normally we like two or three years to plan for like big exhibitions. Uh, but we caved into them, and uh, so we put this exhibition on within a year's time. So a lot of planning. So again, a lot of people helped us out. Uh, so in 2017, uh, this was the uh, the, the mounted uh, blue whale skeleton. Uh, yes, uh, and as mentioned, um, uh, it was mentioned. Uh, it was it was called "Out of the Depths: uh, The Blue Whale Story." Um, but uh, at uh, the year that it opened up in 2017. Um, there was another tragic event uh, happened in, uh, in um, the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, so over the course of that summer, uh, there were 12 uh, North Atlantic right whales uh, that were found dead, uh, like washed ashore. Uh, and most of them had died from uh, collisions with ships. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the skeleton, so this is the skeleton of the uh, uh, one of those whales that we got. Uh, and then there's damage, um, uh, I think, on the upper right of the skull. 
Um, uh, so basically, we assume that that was where the ship had hit uh, the right whale. Uh, yeah, so so now we're thinking, oh, well, um, you know, you know, now we can talk about not just, you know, specifically the blue whale, but now we can talk about, you know, more broadly about conservation, because the North Atlantic right whale is even more endangered uh, than the blue whale is. It's one of the most endangered uh, species on Earth. Um, so, uh, but we also had a sperm whale that had washed ashore on uh, Prince Edward Island. Uh, this is going back 20 years. Um, that had been cleaned off, but we, you know, just hadn't got around to uh, preparing it for display purposes. So, uh, so we said, okay, well, we, now we can also display the sperm whale, which is the largest toothed animal. Uh, so now we can, you know, talk more broadly about whales, uh, the biology evolution, uh, but also their, their conservation. Uh, so that's where the idea of the great whale exhibition, uh, which, um, which closed last year at the ROM came from. Uh, yeah, so so this is just the um, uh, picture of the the entrance uh, to the Great Whales exhibition. Uh, yeah, so now I'll, I'll just go through so, some of the stuff that we uh, that we talked to or that we displayed at, in the exhibition. Uh, then I'll finish off with some of the research uh, that we're actually doing ourselves uh, on whales. Um, so of course, you know, we talk about the size. So we're only focusing on you know what we call you know the great whales. So these are the whales that are. Uh, on average, uh, more than 10 meters long, um, uh, more than 10 tons in weight. Uh, but again, uh, the blue whale is the biggest of them all. So some of them, uh, again, these are all estimates because nobody has a scale that goes up to 150 tons. Uh, so it's really just sort of length and girth and those, those types of calculations. So <clears throat> the accuracy uh, is not all that great. Um, but uh, so some have reported up to 150, but so we put that in perspective of, you know, how many right whales will that take? Uh, what's that equal to in sperm whales? Um, but also, uh, as you can see, uh, you know, the blue whale was bigger than any dinosaur around. Um, so sauropods are considered uh, the biggest dinosaurs, but again, weight-wise, um, uh, uh, it would take a couple of sauropods to equal the weight of a blue whale. We give the comparison to elephants, and of course, about 2,000 humans uh, would uh, be the uh, equivalent weight for blue whales. I don't have a picture over here, but uh, we also had a scale that people can walk on, but we didn't give you the weight of you on the scale. We gave you, we, we calculated how many of you it would take to equal uh, a blue whale. So basically, if you stepped on there, it would plus or minus 2,000 of you to make up a blue whale. Uh, and then we uh, had sections talking about um, sort of the... Uh, the life history, the biology of uh, blue whales. So we had a life-size uh, model, touchable model of the blowhole of a blue whale. Uh, so it has two nostrils. Um, uh, tooth whales only have one nostril, so that's the difference between one, one difference. Obviously, well, one has teeth and the other has baleen, uh, but also the nostrils are different. Uh, baleen whales have two nostrils. Um, uh, tooth whales uh, have only one. Uh, we also talk about uh, diving, their physiology. Uh, so the sperm whale uh, is the deepest diving whale. So they can go down to, you know, about two kilometers. Uh, so that's getting really deep in the oceans. Uh, blue whales, maximum only about 500 meters. Um, right whales, uh, about 200 meters. Uh, again, another interactive thing was that... Um, yeah, you could time yourself, how, you know, how long can you hold your breath for it? Yeah, so a sperm whale will hold their breath for like an hour while they do these deep dives. Uh, whereas uh, humans, if you can hold your breath for a minute, you, you're doing pretty good, right? Uh, so again, that, that was another interactive thing. Uh, but that also brings up the fact that the Great Whales exhibition came out, you know, in the middle of, of the COVID pandemic. Um, so people were a little bit skittish about touching things, right? You know, so we said, well, we're going to let people do this and we just have hand sanitizers or, you know, disposable gloves. Um, but we decided that it's probably better that we just get rid of our interactive. So, so this is one of the things that, um, yeah, so we, we had the breath holding interactive for the blue whale uh, and, you know, people loved it. You know, uh, they were challenged, you know, the family would go in and challenge each other and how long they could hold the breath. Uh, but this time, um, uh, so th th this was a casualty uh, of COVID uh, was that the, the interactive things at the ROM, uh, we had to really cut down or basically eliminate uh, a lot of that. Uh, there was a section on intelligence. 
so the uh, so these are models of um, uh, life size brain. So the one the big one in the middle is the brain of a uh, sperm whale. So the sperm whale has the largest brain of any animal. So even though the blue whale is bigger, the blue whale brain is a little bit smaller uh, than the sperm whale. Uh, on the right, we have uh, a model of a human brain. So obviously uh, a fraction, uh, like a less, probably less than a quarter of the size of the sperm whale. But proportionally, uh, obviously the human brain is a lot bigger. Um, but just by sheer size or volume, uh, the, the sperm whale is the biggest brain. And, and on the left uh, is uh, not, not the brain, but the endocast of the, the skull of a sauropod dinosaur. Uh, yeah, so remember the sauropod is um, like half the size of the blue whale, but you can see that, you know, uh, brain uh, uh, size wise, it's like, um, you know, size of a, you know, a couple of walnuts, uh, basically, uh, for such a big animal. Uh, so its brain was very, very small compared to, uh, uh, to mammals in general. Uh, then up above, we talked about communication. Uh, we also had a, a sound chamber. As we had two sound chambers. So the, the first sound chamber uh, looked at um, so the infrasonic um, uh, sounds uh, that the baleen whales make. Uh, so the, the, these are sounds that are below our hearing. Uh, so these sounds are used for communication. Uh, so I've got a little video clip uh, from the actual exhibition. Get this thing going here. Yeah, so Uh, yeah, so, so these calls, um, they're of such a low frequency that they can travel hundreds of kilometers. Uh, so when people said, in, ge in general, people originally uh, said that blue whales were solitary animals, except for like a mother uh, and her young. Um, but being that they can communicate with people uh, up to a thousand kilometers away, so that, that gives a different definition of, you know, what it is to be alone. Uh, are they really alone? Because uh, they, they seem to be able to talk with whales hundreds of kilometers away. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's another uh, sort of interesting uh, area of you know, further research going on uh, actively. Uh, yeah, so we, we talked a little bit more about um, sort of the life history. So this, this is just uh, some of the graphics we use. Comparing uh, our three whales, the blue whale, uh, right whale, and sperm whale uh, at different age groups, um, so young, juvenile, adult, um, uh, so not just length and, and weight, but also uh, some of the, the different things they do in life as well. Uh, another highlight uh, is the, uh, the heart of a blue whale. Uh, so this is the real heart. Uh, so this is placinated. So um, some of you might, have, might remember, um, it was an exhibition called, I think, Body Worlds or Body Works. It was at the Science Center, but uh, it was looking under the skin of, uh, I think the first one was uh, people, humans, but then the second one was was animals. Um, so uh, basically, we got our blue whale heart done that way. Uh, so, um, and, and, and they did, uh, you know, uh, an amazing job. Uh, in the lower uh, left, um, we were comparing the hearts uh, of other animals. Uh, so the sort of the big one in the background is of a killer whale. Uh, but then on the right is the human heart. On the left of the human heart is a raccoon heart. And then uh, there's a little small magnifying glass. But then we also had a heart of a, a little mouse, giving you an idea of the differences in sizes for the different species. Um, and then we also had how much volume of blood uh, was pumped uh, for each stroke, uh, just to give you an idea of you know, how, how big this uh, blue whale heart uh, is. Uh, yeah, so these are pictures. Uh, yeah, so on the left, that is what the heart looked like um, when it was recovered from the, the Rocky Harbor blue whale. So it's this sort of flat mess. <laughs> uh, so, but we brought it, we froze it, brought it back, uh, preserved it in formalin. Uh, and then uh, you can see it was all packaged up and it was uh, shipped to Germany. Uh, so uh, 
the von Hagens are the people that actually did the body worlds. As, uh, they, they basically, they invented this plastination technique. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, so the heart ended up being the single largest organ that they have ever done before. So we, we were challenging them and then they accepted the challenge. Uh, but it, it took uh, over a year for them to plastinate that heart. It, it's a long drawn out process. It's got to be put into a vacuum chamber to remove any excess water because the, the water is what causes the decomposition to, you know, to happen slowly. Um, but then the vacuum chamber um, uh, is used to basically um, to insert silicone into where the water was in the cell uh, to get, you know, the, the heart to look lifelike again, because obviously uh, in the left-hand photo, you know, when it died and, and by, the, by the time we got there, it was dead like two months already. So there was decomposition happening. Uh, and, um, uh, but, uh, but by injecting the silicone, it, it sort of, you know, got the cells back to normal size uh, to the point where um, uh, it looks it looks real. So they, so they did a really good job uh, doing that. Uh, yeah, so this is a picture of, uh, um, of the von Hagen uh, plastination uh, facility in Germany. Uh, yeah, so basically, um, yeah, so they are, uh, I think, preparing um, the heart uh, in that vat. Uh, that vat might be, it's either formalin or acetone, I think. Uh, and then the, the other photo, I think, is probably after, uh, it looks like in pretty good shape, but it was after they had probably injected the silicone. And it's a picture, of, it's a little video of my colleague, Jackie, explaining. Some interesting finer structure. Certainly what we've shown here is we dissected through the epicardium. This is the paper part, is the outside of the heart. Underneath the epicardium, you actually see the muscle of the heart, the myocardium. That's this, that is the state. Yeah, so every time we, uh, we sent out a media release about the blue whale, um, the media would come flocking like Discovery Channel. Uh, they documented every single stage uh, of the process um, and all the news and uh, all the newspapers uh, would always come, um, you know, to, to cover the latest thing that we're doing. So there, there was a lot of media coverage uh, for the blue whale. Uh, okay, so now, now let's get back to uh, the Great Whale Exhibition. So one of the things we added um, that we didn't have for um, the blue whale exhibition that we added for the Great Whale Exhibition. So uh, we talk about life, but we also talk about death. Uh, so when uh, most whale car uh, whales die, they actually do sink. Um, but that's actually a good thing uh, because it, it uh, brings down stuff to the bottom of the ocean because um, uh, there's not much at the bottom of the ocean, right? Uh, so when a whale fall, you know, when a whale dies and, and goes to the bottom, uh, basically, it, it creates a whole new ecosystem uh, at the bottom of the ocean going, you know, down a kilometer or more. Uh, yeah, so we actually uh, got a, uh, so in the middle of that photo uh, is, and in, in, in on the right-hand side, uh, it's a, it was a 3D, um, uh, it was a 3D model that we downloaded uh, from the website. So basically, th this is a real uh, blue whale um, uh, carcass that was found off the coast of Monterey in California. Um, so this was um, NOAA, the uh, National Oceanographic uh, Association uh, in the U.S. Um, yeah, so we just printed this thing. Um, so I'm not sure what the scale is, the 100th scale. I can't remember what it was. Um, uh, to give an idea of what uh, half, the, so one half was just the bones. The other half was the, the, the fleshed uh, body. Uh, but then we talked about, you know, all the different organisms that fed off of this dead whale. So in the beginning, so you can see the shark up above. Uh, so sharks literally come off and just take chunks of meat off and, and uh, they eat that. Uh, but you can see a display on the left side. Um, so, but there's a whole bunch of other smaller things like crabs and starfish um, that slowly consume, um, uh, you know, the whale carcass, you know, for years and years. Uh, and this, I think this is a, another short video uh, that looks at that. When a whale dies, its body usually sinks. This is called a whale fall. At the bottom of the ocean, it becomes nourishment for hungry ocean scavengers.
After sharks and larger animals have removed the flesh, other creatures move in to benefit from the carcass. Octopus and long slender fish called eel pelts finish off the scraps of meat left on the bones. Organisms without backbones, like worms and isopods, devour decomposing tissue. While small organisms, called zombie worms, penetrate into the bone and consume the nutrients within. And crabs comb the surrounding seafloor for leftover bits of food. The whale's hard, stiff plates of baleen take longer to break down and can even remain intact after all of the skeleton is stripped clean. From octopus and fish to lobsters and sea spiders, a whale fall supports a huge ecosystem of diverse life for decades. Eventually, even the last remnants of its bones are consumed back into the food web. Yeah, so this, uh, the ecosystem is so unique is that those zombie worms, um, when they first discovered, uh, not, not this carcass, but uh, one of the earlier carcasses, um, they, they had to describe uh, new species for these zombie worms because nobody had seen them before. So, so that's how uh, unique or unusual uh, these whale falls are. Uh, and of course, we uh, talk about evolution. Um, so, uh, yeah, so in the upper left, you can see uh, three skeletons, uh, and then the, uh, the other photo has two skeletons. Uh, so basically, we, we were looking, um, basically charting um, sort of the tree of life uh, for whales. So on the, uh, so the graphic on the right-hand side, uh, you can see uh, sort of in the middle bottom, uh, the, uh, the five, uh, the five uh, Fossil whales uh, flushed out as we as we think they might look. Uh, so obviously, you know, the, the, the fossils are only the bones, uh, but artists um, and scientists have gotten together to sort of figure out what they might look like um, uh, on the on the outside with their skin. Uh, so the only one I'll, I'll talk about here is um, the one with the uh, the illustration right in the middle. Uh, so that is a skeleton, uh, the species, uh, the genus and species. Uh, the genus is uh, called Pachycetus. Uh, so this was found um, basically um, in the mountains of uh, Pakistan near, near the Himalayas. Um, so the, the the thing that had sort of baffled biologists, you know, for the longest time, like, uh, go, even going back to the time of Darwin. Um, so he he had ideas of you know what whales were related. To. So yeah, so we, we you know we knew that whales were mammals, but we we really didn't know what whales were related to. What are the mammals? Just because you know they're so different. You know, they're uh, marine uh, mammals, you know, so they've lost their legs. So, so there, there wasn't really a good missing link to connect it with, you know, what other mammal it might be related to uh, until uh, that uh, fossil in the middle of their Pachycetus was discovered in the 1980s. Um, so the, the thing is that um, there are certain telltale bones. So for um, like hoofed uh, animals, uh, you know, like cows and deer, uh, they, they've got um, like uh, an ankle bone that is like uh, is it's hint like it's, it has a double pulley system, uh, so that that's how you know when a cow you know sits down it sort of folds its leg up in that weird accordion way, um, yeah. So you know we can't do that because like our foot um, it's hinged at the shin bone, but the toes aren't hinged. The whole the toes just basically stick straight out. You you can wiggle your toes, but you can't bend them underneath you know your ankle, um, but uh, but hoofed uh, animals can do that, uh, like deer uh, and cows. Um, so if you find a double hinged uh, ankle bone, you know it's a hoofed mammal. Uh, and uh, this fossil, when it was found in 1980s, uh, it was a hoofed animal. It was, it was a new species. And it's, oh, this is great. It's a new species. It's, it's a new uh, hoofed animal. Um, but then, uh, it, but it wasn't known immediately. Then people started looking at other parts of the bones, and then they got to the ear bone. So the interesting thing about the ear bone is that uh, all whales um, have a thickening of the bone at the bottom uh, of the ear bones, uh, and we, uh, people think that's because um, because of their communication underwater. Um, so basically, a lot of those vibrations of those infrasonic calls that are coming back. 
um, it hits the jawbone, the big jawbone that vibrate, vibrates against the bottom of the ear bone uh, in the skull. Uh, and, and that's how the messages get, you know, to the brain of, you know, what the returning, you know, call is about. Um, so they think that, you know, the, the, the ear bone in Wales has that extra thickening to protect it, you know, from that big vibrating jaw. Um, so when they looked at the ear bone of Pachycetus, they said, it's a whale. He said, we found the missing link because this is the first specimen that had those two, te two te uh, telltale bones, the ankle bone and the ear bone. But of course, whales, um, they don't have their legs anymore. They, they're, they're remnants of the hip bones, but uh, all their leg uh, and their ankle bones are gone. So whales don't have ankle bones. So we, we never saw the ankle bone of a whale. We didn't know that it was it would have been hinged until this specimen, Pachycetus had the ankle bone of a hoofed animal and the ear bone of a whale. Uh, then the second interesting thing is that not only did that say that, um, you know, this was a, um, uh, an ancestral species of whales, but it also said that whales weren't, you know, off on the side of with other mammals here. Whales were right in the middle of all these hoofed animals. Uh, and then it was really um, molecular data that sort of brought it all together. Uh, so we can see that, um, yeah, you, you probably can't really see it, uh, but um, the closest living relative of whales is the hippopotamus. Uh, so that sort of cemented, so that brought together the fossil information, the anatomy, but, uh, but it brought it together with the genetic data um, that uh, whales are actually just hoofed animals, uh, but obviously very highly derived, highly evolved uh, hoofed animals. Okay, um, so then uh, the next section is talking about diet. Uh, so we had a cast of the blue whale skull, but the, the real baleen. Uh, so we talk about, um, you know, uh, whales split between toothed whales, uh, but also the baleen whales, which are the filter feeders. Uh, yeah, so this, the, this became a very popular um, uh, sort of selfie station. Uh, so people, and, and in fact, we had uh, costumes that like, costumes of krill. So blue whale eats primarily like small shrimp krill. So we had costumes that they, they could dress up uh, in krill costumes and the parents could take pictures of them being eaten by a blue whale. Uh, but that was another casualty of uh, COVID because obviously we, we, we didn't want kids to be putting, taking, putting on and taking off these costumes hundreds of times a day uh, because of the, uh, the COVID situation. Uh, so that was another thing that sort of, uh, 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 got eliminated um, uh, because of COVID. So it was in the Blue Whale Exhibition, but not the Great Whale Exhibition. Uh, so other things we had was um, in the lower right, we had a, a video, uh, again, uh, a H HD video of a blue whale uh, feeding. Uh, so basically the blue whale opens its big mouth um, it, and then the throat is actually pleated. So it actually can balloon up um, so it, it, so uh, when it goes through a big swarm of krill, uh, it picks up as much krill as possible, closes its mouth, uh, and then uses its tongue uh, to force the water out through the baleen, but then the krill get caught on the inside of the baleen. So the baleen is just like a, a filtering sieve system. Uh, and that, and so, so that's how you know, the biggest animal eats some of the smallest thing. Uh, it's because of uh, this baleen feeding adaptation. Uh, and um, unfortunately, another casualty of COVID was uh, for the Blue Whale exhibition, we had these three uh, uh, video game, uh, arcade games made up. So basically, uh, I, is this, um, is this interactive? But basically, um, uh, the kids, well, not just kids, adults like playing it too, but basically, um, uh, during a dive, um, you would have to eat enough food to survive. Um, uh, but uh, as, as you play the game, you realize that there are, uh, there are denser swarms of krill deeper down in the ocean. Uh, so it's better to dive deep before you start feeding. Uh, but also, if you stayed near the surface, you'd have to, you know, be careful about getting hit by a ship, you know, again, which is a, a real life situation. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, so basically, uh, the people that were playing were trying to get as high a score as possible, you know, based on how much krill they're eating. 
Um, so basically every day we had the high score so people can type in their name. So they, <laughs> they get recognized for having the high score. Uh, so th again, that was a very popular game that, um, uh, that we couldn't do uh, because of the, the COVID restrictions. Uh, and uh, we had a second sound chamber. So this uh, looked at echolocation. Uh, so this is the high frequency calls, not, not the infrasonic uh, calls like the baleen whales do. So the, the sperm or the tooth whales have high frequency calls that we can't hear, uh, but they use that not for communication, uh, but, but they use it for uh, hunting, for, for getting their food. So uh, here is a... Yeah, I think, I think this is a two-minute video clip um, of, how, uh, of how sperm whales use echolocation to find food. Uh, in this particular case, um, a giant squid. So obviously that was this all uh, CGI graphic type stuff, but basically that uh, gives a good summary of how um, sperm whales hunt for the food. Okay, uh, and then the, the last section of the exhibition, we, um, uh, we talked about conservation, uh, but before that uh, we had a little uh, display talking about you know, how did whales ended up being threatened? Um, that was because of the whaling uh, industry uh, going back, you know, even before the 1900s. Um, so this was before uh, petroleum oil was discovered. So, you know, uh, usually in a house uh, at night, it was whale oil that was used uh, for lighting at night. Uh, so we had examples of lamps uh, at the ROM uh, that were used uh, in the 1800s. Um, but then when petroleum oil was found, um, yeah, that, was, that was actually a good thing, um, you know, for whales is that, uh, so now whales weren't hunted um, for their oil you know, from their blubber, um, but people were still hunting them. So they, they started to, to find other uses, uh, you know, for whales. 
so above uh, the picture above is um, so the baleen uh, that's in the mouth uh, of the baleen whales uh, that was used so it was made out of uh, keratin so they're hard stiff uh, material uh, so they were used in uh, corsets um, and then they started uh, using uh, the fat and the blubber in things like soap and margarine. Uh, they would use the whale meat as fertilizer. Uh, so it got to the point uh, by you know the mid 1900s, um, just about every single species of whale was endangered uh, until you know there was a moratorium uh, on uh, the hunting of whales. Uh, an another aspect we talk about is uh, sort of the indigenous perspective. Um, yeah, so so there, um, yeah, so uh, in the Arctic, they they hunt um, uh, whales up there. Um, but again, it's more sustainable. Uh, so they'll hunt like one whale that will feed, you know, basically the whole community, you know, for the whole summertime. Um, so a different perspective of um, sort of a use and sustainability uh, from an indigenous perspective. Uh, yeah, so this is a painting um, by a contemporary indigenous artist. Uh, so I think this is called Star and Whale. Uh, uh, looking at um, uh, whaling from um, uh, from their perspective. Uh, and of course, we talk about the conservation uh, research and recovery. So this is a picture of the blue whale that uh, we got in 2017 that was hit by a, a ship. Uh, so we talk about um, you know some of the threats to um, uh, not only uh, right whales, but also whales in general. Uh, so there's a lot of old fishing net that just you know, gets, um, it just float, it's called ghost net, ghost nets. Uh, they're just floating because they've, um, they've been forgotten about. Uh, they got off of their ropes. Uh, but of course, whales get tangled up in them. Um, so we also look at, you know, some ways to, you know, you know, hopefully remedy that situation. So instead of, uh, so this uh, in the bottom uh, right is, um, uh, so these are lobster or, or crab traps that are at the bottom of the ocean, but the old way is that, you know, there'll be a rope that's connected to the traps. Uh, so after a while, you know, they'll, they'll haul up, you know, the rope to get to the traps, but of course, you know, these ropes, uh, whales can get tangled up in them. Uh, so they now developed ropeless traps, uh, whereas basically you're at the surface when you're ready to bring up the traps, you just hit a button, uh, a buoy pops out and a float that brings the trap back up to the surface so that the rope isn't always there all the time. Um, yeah, so, so that, th those are some of the conservation measures um, that, are, that are in place now to um, hopefully uh, let the, uh, the whales recover. Uh, and then we also talk about um, you know, some of the organizations that are out there uh, on the front lines doing uh, the conservation work uh, you know, to save you know, whales, um, uh, which are you know, some of the most endangered species out there. Uh, and then I'll just finish off with uh, some of the research that we're doing at the ROM. Uh, so we have se sequenced the uh, genome of the blue whale. Uh, so the genome of the blue whale is, it's about uh, two and a half billion DNA base pairs. Um, so obviously a lot of information there. Uh, so we've sequenced it uh, for the blue whale. Uh, so one of the studies um, uh, that we, we actually just submitted uh, this paper um, uh, within uh, uh, I think just before Christmas, uh, but this is looking at uh, the DNA, uh, lo looking at the population genetics um, um, uh, of blue whales. Uh, so you can see a bit of the color coding. Um, yeah, so the, uh, on the figure A, so Canada, uh, the, the specimens that we had are in red, uh, but we also got samples from Iceland and Norway, they're in blue. Uh, we only have one sample from, uh, uh, from the Antarctic uh, Ocean. Um, but, uh, yeah, so when you look at, uh, uh, figure B, we see that the Northeast Atlantic around Iceland and, New uh, Iceland and Norway, uh, so they group, uh, so their DNA is more similar to each other than to the other samples we have. Um, but then the samples in red, uh, so that's from the Northwest Atlantic, uh, you see, uh, they all don't group amongst themselves, uh, because, uh, there are um, like three samples that are below the blue samples that group with the blue samples, not with the other red samples. So that is an interesting uh, population um, uh, genetic story. Uh, why that is, we don't know, but that just says that um, the North and the West 
uh, Atlantic Ocean population aren't uh, separate populations. So there is some type of gene flow. Uh, so from a conservation perspective, that that's that's a good thing because uh, so instead of having two small populations uh, that might die out, they're they're actually a bigger population. So in that respect, uh, that might be a good thing. Uh, the other interesting thing we found uh, is in in uh, uh, the figure C uh, is that we also included fin uh, fin whale samples, uh, which is the gray, the lower left. Uh, but you can see that there is this one sample uh, that's sort of in between the yellow, red, and blue. There's one sample encircled in, in, uh, in red. Uh, so that we, we we consider that a hybrid between a fin whale and a blue whale. So that that has been proposed before. Uh, so our genetic data actually supports. Uh, the fact that there are uh, there is hybridization between the blue whale and the fin whale. Uh, so again, that obviously complicates you know conservation uh, management issues um, uh, because there there is um, uh, some type of gene flow happening uh, between uh, those two different species uh, of whales. Uh, and uh, yeah, so so basically uh, that is it for my presentation. So. Uh, uh, hopefully you've got a good flavor of uh, of uh, the great whales in Canada. Uh, we're not we're not just Canada, but uh, in the world. Uh, and um, I am open for any questions.